Hello and welcome to part 3 in this series of videos that I'm putting out this week where I break down all the fights taking place this weekend at UFC on ESPN plus 6 from a betting perspective. Now I've already covered 6 fights on this card from a betting perspective in parts 1 and 2 of this video. I will link in the description below links for you to go and check those videos out. I highly recommend taking a look at those. And in part one of the, the, this series of videos, I said that this week was a massively busy week for me. We've got Bellator 218 tomorrow night, as well as KSW 47 on Saturday afternoon, and then obviously UFC on ESPN Plus 6 on Saturday night. So this is a massively busy week for me, but to be honest with you, I am smashing through this UFC card, and I'm much further ahead of schedule than I normally would be. Now, I think that's for two reasons. The first reason being... Um, Obviously, I'm conscious that I've got a lot of Bellator and KSW fights to research this week. So, literally, I haven't left my desk since like 9 o'clock Monday morning. I've been relentlessly researching these fights. And for that reason, I'm probably a little bit further along in my research than I usually would be at this stage in a week. And obviously, the second reason is that so many of these fights are just easy passes. You know, if you've watched part 1 and 2 of this video, there aren't really many bets that I like. And in order for me to, to, to you know, part with my money and place a bet on a fighter, I need to absolutely love a bet. I have to love it. And so far, there's not really that many bets on this card that I love. But I'll keep digging. Still got a few fights left to research on this card. Covering another three fights in today's video. And the fights that I'm covering today's, in, in today's video, I've seen a lot of people discussing online. So I'm hoping... You're going to find the information that I put in this video useful. And please, guys, please hit the like button below uh, if you like this video. Please also consider in subscribing to help the channel grow. And it is now, you know, quarter to nine, you know, 8.45 on Thursday night. There's still uh, uh, more than 48 hours to go before UFC on ESPN Plus 6 starts on Saturday night. So smash the like button and I'll continue to try and get as much uh, fight content out this week as I can who knows maybe I'll be able to get part four of this video out or at the very least a bonus video for Bellator 218 or KSW 47. I did make a video yesterday which you can check out on my channel uh, all about KSW betting so there's also a bonus video that I promised in that video go check that out to see what I'm talking about and yeah I'm ahead of schedule so hopefully I'll be able to bring you more content this week but the first fight that I want to talk about in today's video is Luis Pena versus Steven Peterson. So the story of this card really for me has been, you know, potential bets that I've ended up just deciding to pass on for various reasons. If you've watched parts one and two of this video, you'll know why. And again, Steven Peterson was another name that jumped out at me. You know, so many names jumped out at me on this card. And seeing Luis Pena is such a big favourite was a bit of a head scratcher for me. Obviously, we can see here in the last... Oh, let me just refresh this to make sure we've got the latest odds up. But in the last 24 hours, we've seen a bit of money come in on Pena on some sites. Uh, you know, a couple days ago, he was down as low as uh, 1.34. Now he is up to around about a minus 250 favourite, which is 1.40 on, uh, on the majority of betting sites. So... I have seen a lot of people say that they, they think Steven, Stevenson's a good bet this weekend. Uh, sorry, Peterson combined both his first name and his last name there. A lot of the people online saying they're taking a shot on Peterson this weekend. And, and that's cool. You know, that is cool. I'll give you how I feel about this fight here and, and hopefully it'll make you make your mind. Uh, hopefully it will help you uh, decide on which way you want to bet this fight if you want to bet it at all. So first of all, the, the, the thing we've got to call out is the fact that Luis Pena uh, has competed at lightweight for the majority of his career, which is kind of insane because at six foot three, he's absolutely enormous. He's got a 78 inch reach, which is crazy. You know, there are, there are light heavyweights and heavyweights uh, which don't have a 78 inch reach, which is absolutely insane. So Luis Pena as a lightweight was absolutely huge. Which is crazy because he's dropping down to featherweight for this fight against Steven Peterson. So it's going to be insane. At featherweight, Pena is easily going to be the biggest ever featherweight to compete in the UFC. I think that was a bit of an assumption. But aside from George Roop, I don't really remember anyone being as tall as him. Um, so yeah, it's, it's absolutely insane. And this picture here on his Instagram profile... 
just kind of highlights how insane it is that he is going to be competing at featherweight here obviously Pena trains at the uh, American Kickboxing Academy and here you can see Cain Velasquez who trains at heavyweight and this is Luis Pena who is going to be competing this weekend at featherweight and here you can see Pena looks bigger than him which is crazy you know a few inches taller I'm sure the hairdo makes makes the height difference look a little bit bigger than it probably is in reality but again you know, you, you would not expect a featherweight to be standing, to, to look like that standing next to Cain Velasquez. And that is significant in this fight because obviously size matters. If we take a look at the tail of the tape, uh, you know, Steven Peterson's only 5 foot 9 with a 70 inch reach. And Luis Pena's 6 foot 3 with, with a 78 inch reach. So not only is Pena going to tower over him, but he's also got an extra 8 inches of reach. To be able to land uh, on Peterson for positions where Peterson isn't going to be able to counter unless he puts himself in extreme danger, gets into boxing range and really commits to his shots. And that's significant because if two guys uh, are in a stick fight, you know, and one guy's stick is a lot longer than the other guy's stick, he's got a big advantage. Reach is a huge thing. Eight inches of reach is a lot. Uh, and, it's, and this is extra significant because... Peterson's striking defense isn't very good. It just isn't. He blocks a lot of punches with his face, takes a ton of damage, doesn't move his head that much, doesn't use much footwork. And Pena does throw a really wide range of strikes, you know, elbows, straight punches, hooks, uppercuts, kicks, the works. So Pena is dangerous here. And we have also seen in the past Pena does have KO power. You know, he rocked Richie Smullen pretty bad. Wobble Jose Martinez as well on the Ultimate Fighter. So we know that he hits hard. He also fights, uh, does a reasonably good job of fighting long. And for a tall guy, you know, a lot of the time when we see um, abnormally tall guys for a division, they tend to be quite clunky in the way they move and, uh, and, and quite slow. Whereas Pena is very athletic and explosive, even at six foot three with 78 inch reach. He's very, very sharp. I'm not sure how sharp he's going to be now that he's dropping down to featherweight, where he's going to be facing faster opponents, theoretically, than he would have been competing against at lightweight. But Steven Peterson's not particularly fast, not particularly explosive. So I don't think it's going to cause him too much issues. Now, I ran into talking about how these guys match up from a striking point of view, without really uh, mentioning the fact that Pena's obviously been asked about his weight cut this week. If you go on to YouTube, I'm not going to play it in this video because... He doesn't really say a lot that's worth playing, but if you go onto YouTube, go to the MMA Junkie YouTube channel, check out the Fight Week interview from Luis Pena. He basically says that when he fought at 155 pounds, he didn't cut any weight at all to make the 155 pound weight limit. He said he just used to walk around at around about 155 pounds, and that's why he's dropping down the featherweight because he knows that he can cut weight and make the featherweight limit easily. He said he'll make it easily. Now, having seen Pena's past fights, I'm not sure how he's going to make the weight because he's very lean at 155 pounds. I don't see where he's losing the extra 10 pounds from, but Pena is uh, is saying he's going to make it easily, and I guess we're going to find out because the, the early weigh-ins take place in around, I'm guessing, 16 or 17 hours from now. So we'll find out soon enough if if uh, Pena really is going to have an easy weight cut. But yeah, when it comes to this fight from a stylistic point of view, um, like I say, Pena's got a huge advantage striking. Peterson has kind of got the, the Diaz style where he tries to walk people down, put a lot of pressure on them uh, and look to break them with pressure and aggression. But Pena hits very hard, does a good job of fighting long and Peterson, bad striking defence, takes a ton of damage. You think that Pena would be able to keep him... Uh, stay on the outside and basically pick him off as he comes forward and potentially hurt him really bad and knock him down as well. Like I say, Pena's got uh, quite heavy hands for someone as tall and lean as him. In many ways, reminds me a little bit of James Vick in, in his style of striking. Also, Pena, um, also what I would say about Peterson is he has quite a predictable style of fighting. So he just comes forward looks to take a cent control the centre of the octagon, and like I say, put loads of pressure on his opponents and break them with pressure. That's quite an easy style to game plan for. If uh, Pena and his team, American Kickboxing Academy, have done their homework on Peterson, which I'm guessing they will have because it's an incredible gym with great trainers, uh, Pena should be coming in this fight with a pretty solid game plan. It's, it's quite an easy stylistic matchup for him. Now, 
probably the most uh, the, the the most surprising thing about Pena is when you have a guy who is abnormally tall for their division. Usually, um, usually they've got bad takedown defense and weak wrestling because obviously they're very tall. They're very lean. They're like a skyscraper. If you attack the bottom of a of, of a tall building. That's how you 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 turn the, the the building over and cause it to you know go down so to speak. That's why that when they demolish buildings, they put explosives at the bottom. Same with a guy that's really abnormally tall for their division. Usually, when they're really tall, you can get in deep on their hips, upset their balance, and completely easy takedowns. But Pena training at a, a grappling heavy gym like American Kickboxing Academy is a really strong wrestler. He he really defies the general rule. Of, of abnormally tall fighters struggling to fight long not being that athletic and not having good takedown defense really Pena does have all those things he's very very unique and very interesting now I don't know if he's going to have those skills uh, at featherweight I don't know if they're going to carry down with him from lightweight to featherweight but at, at lightweight he, he's, he's got really quite decent takedown defense not bulletproof takedown defense but he's not difficult to get down and when he's on the ground he's very tricky very technical and those long limbs enable him to you know create opportunities that other guys wouldn't be able to create to scramble back to his feet and also to trap guys in nasty submissions with his long limbs so that's interesting but what, what i also want to say guys before we wrap up striking i know i've kind of, kind of jumping out all, all over the place here but i also just want to make the point and just looking at my notes the stephen peterson doesn't wear damage very well so he tends to get cut up and busted up quite easily just because his striking defense isn't that good uh, and he does cut very easily so by the end of fights he's normally busted up pretty bad remember i said in yesterday's video in part two which i'll link in the description below when we're talking about alexis davis um damage inflicted is now one of the major scoring criteria in MMA since the judging scoring criteria changed in January 2016. So if this fight does end up being relatively close uh, and Peterson's busted up really bad, you know, the judges may decide to score rounds in Pena's favour just for damage inflicted, you know, even if Stephen was a Stephen Peterson was able to get, you know, some grappling control or, you know, outstrike Pena, maybe damage inflicted would trump that because it is supposed to be a priority for judges to score damage now. So um thing I've covered most things. What I would say is that um you know, Peterson does shoot the odd takedown here and there. He's quite a strong wrestler, but he also makes the mistake of getting overly aggressive at times, uh, which causes him to give up position. And Pena's a strong grappler, dangerous on the ground. I mean, this is just Pena's fight to lose, to be honest with you guys. He's, he's, he's better than Peterson everywhere. The size difference is going to make life really difficult with Peterson. And the thing about Peterson is, it's going to be so difficult for him to close the distance and land anything significant on Pena because of that height and reach advantage that he's probably not going to have too much uh, too much success standing and on the ground he also I give Pena the, the advantage as well because he's very technical very strong strong grappling coming from American Kickboxing Academy so let's take a look at this fight from a betting perspective if we take a look at the odds so like we said uh, a bit earlier on, Pena's odds have improved now to 1.40, which is minus uh, 250. Now, that gives him an implied probability of 71%. If you've watched my videos uh, for, for the last month or so, it will come as no surprise to you when I say I would recommend passing on him. Because, you know, he's never fought a featherweight before. This might be his first time cutting from lightweight to featherweight. Who knows how his body's going to react to the cut. You know, he might think he can make 145 easily, but it's a whole different ball game when you actually have to do it. So, cannot bet Pena in this fight because in order to get any real tangible value there and margin over the betting side, you'd have to give him a 76% or better chance of winning. And that is a big, big stretch uh, considering the fact that he's going to be putting his body through a lot, cutting down to £145 in this fight. But I've seen a lot of people... Uh, considering a bet on Peterson this week. So really, let's focus in on this and uh, and have a think about this. So the average odds available on Peterson at the moment is 3.10, which is uh, plus 210, giving him an implied probability of 32%. Now, I can see why people would bet Peterson here. I'm not going to call Peterson a bad bet. I don't think Peterson is necessarily a bad bet. 
although this is not personally the kind of bet that I like. I'm not opposed to rolling the dice and putting my money in risky situations and betting on underdogs. But like I've said in the past, when I do place those kind of bets, I like a fighter to be able to win a fight on merit. So, for example, last week I had a feeling Masvidal would be able to outstrike Till or weather an early storm, drag Till into deep waters and test his cardio. That was a fight that Masvidal could win because of all the things that Masvidal could do. I thought Grundy would, would win the fight because I felt he was probably better than Naramani everywhere. And, uh, and that's why I bet on him as an underdog. And Safarov, again, I felt that he had the ability to go out there, start aggressively, and, and, and really cause a young fighter making a UFC debut on just two weeks' notice a lot of problems. The kind of bets that I don't like, uh, when you, put, you, have to, you have to roll the dice a little bit and take on a little bit more risk on underdogs, are where a guy can only win if their opponent... Um, a guy can only win if their opponent doesn't do things that they're capable of doing. And what, what I mean by that is, can Peterson win this fight? Absolutely, he can definitely win this fight. You know, he can he, he can bring a lot of pressure. He can overwhelm Pena. You know, he can put him on bad positions on the ground, maybe. But if both guys show up and perform to their full potential, I think, you know, seven or eight times out of ten, Luis Pena wins this fight. In order for Peterson to win this, Pena has to either make a mistake, do something wrong, or significantly underperform, uh, underperform, which is very, very possible, but it's just not the kind of, uh, of situations I like to put my money into. I like to bet on guys on merit, not on uh, you know what their opponent may or may not do. So that's why I personally recommend passing on this fight. I don't think Peterson's a terrible bet. You know His odds of 3.10 with an implied probability of 32%. I mean, it's tough for me because I I wouldn't cap this fight as 60-40. I think that I can't give Peterson a 40% chance of winning this fight. I just can't get there because he is significantly second best everywhere. But 32% also feels low. I don't know. I just don't like it. I don't love this bet. I need to love a bet to bet on a fighter and I don't love this one. So let's move on to the next fight which is Macy Barber against JJ Aldrich. So these are two girls uh, that have got a few similarities, I guess. They're both Southpaws, um, which is interesting because Southpaws tend to have a big advantage over most opponents they face because only 30% of professional fighters in the UFC are Southpaw, which means the vast majority of the time they're competing against fighters who fight out of the South uh, orthodox stance. And as we know, Southpaws are very tricky. Most big budget blockbuster boxing movies are based on uh, a southpaw main character who causes orthodox fighters a number of problems because of how tricky it is to deal with because when 70% of fighters uh, fight out of the orthodox stance when you are an orthodox stance fighter you're used to competing against someone that, that also fights orthodox when you suddenly start competing against someone this fights out the southpaw stance it can be very difficult to adjust to and difficult to prepare for it's a strange style you've got strikes coming at you from weird angles and positions that you wouldn't usually see them coming from so that is one of the reasons why you know perhaps someone like macy barber has had so much success uh, competing on the regional circuit in in, in mma you know being a, a very technical southpaw striker is going to cause you know lower level orthodox strikers tons of problems but jj aldrich is also a southpaw striker which is very interesting so both these girls um you know th this one could get interesting from a striking point of view just because i doubt either girl is that comfortable or confident or used to fighting against a fellow southpaw and usually what happens is when you see two southpaws fight each other it tends to be the more experienced southpaw the more comfortable southpaw that's got a lot of experience competing against fellow southpaws that does better which is interesting i'm interested to see how that plays out in this fight but other similarities they've got like i say both girls moving up 
to fight at flyweight in the UFC for the first time. And uh, also, uh, both girls are young, very young in the divisions. They're going to be making big improvements from fight to fight. You know, at 20 years old, Macy Barber is going to be like a sponge. She's going to be ma uh, making massive improvements every fight. And Aldrich, a little bit older at 26, but still, you know, training in Denver, Colorado, alongside the likes of Rose Namajunas and Valentina Shevchenko when she dips in to their camp from time to time. Uh, it's a big deal. You're going to see huge improvements from both these girls. Um, and Macy Barber, in terms of her training, she's a bit of a nomad. She trains all over the place. She travelled around the US, going to lots of different gyms. We've seen her at ATT, Jackson's and Rufus Sport in the past. So jumping into how both these girls match up from a stylistic point of view, uh, let's talk first a little bit about Macy Barber. So what I would say about Barber is she is ferocious in all positions that this fight could go and any fight goes she is ferocious she is vicious and she has the cardio to back it up usually when you see a, a, a fighter like macy barber you would look at them and you'd think okay they're dangerous but there's no way that she can do that for three rounds because of how much uh, explosive energy and she's come into everything but barber can she is a cardio machine and she fights in bursts uh, you will see her um when she's striking, she's kind of got a, uh, a taekwondo kind of stance. She bounces in and out of her opponent's range, a little bit similar to Stephen Thompson. But she likes to be all the way in or all the way out. So at a distance where her opponents can't land on her. Or she likes to blitz them with kicks and short punches and then get back outside of range. Now, that style is tricky to deal with because she uses a lot of footwork. She's very mobile. So it's difficult to kind of trap her and land anything significant. But at the same time, when she is blitzing her opponent, her striking defense isn't very good. So there is a window of opportunity there as she comes in for her opponent to catch her and land big shots on her. Now, she hasn't really fought anyone up until this point in her career who has really been able to make her pay for that poor striking defense. Although we have seen a couple of her past opponents drop her. Um, but they were just flash knockdown. She wasn't really hurt. She wasn't rocked or anything like that. It's just a case of where she's coming forward and blitzing with so much forward momentum. If you catch her when she's coming forward, you know, at a fast pace aggressively, it doesn't really take much to knock someone down. So that is basically um, Barber's style of striking. JJ Aldridge, much more traditional. She likes to march forward, traditional boxing style. Doesn't throw too many kicks. Uh, it's all about the hands for for JJ Aldrich. Now, from a striking point of view, this is a this is an interesting matchup, not only because there's two Southpaws going up against each other, but also because, like I said, it's difficult to outstrike Barber because she's got the cardio to be constantly moving. And your only real windows of opportunity to catch her with a, a big shot or outstrike her is being able to apply enough pressure to trap her in positions where you can let your hands go. Or time counters uh, so that when she comes in and does blitz you, you're ready to catch her with a counter as she comes in. And that is where some of her past opponents have had success against her, where they've been able to catch her as, as she kind of like rushes into range. Now, based on the past performances from JJ Aldrich, I'm not sure if she's going to be able to have that much, sex, uh, that much success striking simply because... She's not particularly great at cutting the octagon off. And when she does cut the octagon off, she's not particularly great at letting her hands go. And also, because we've never really seen her fight someone as, as mobile or, you know, unorthodox as Barber. We don't really know how much success she's going to have counter, countering Barber with, you know, counter shots as Barber blitzes her. At the same time, you know, if we look at Aldrich's record... She is a bit of a decision machine. So her last five fights have gone the distance. You know, the majority of, of women's MMA fights, particularly in the strawweight division and atomweight division, you know, they tend to go the distance. There's nothing wrong with that. But the point that I just want to highlight is that Aldrich doesn't really have that much power in her hands. And Barber has one of those crowd-pleasing, judge-pleasing style of fighting, which is really exciting. So, you know, when Barber's blitzing girls and throwing flashy kicks and landing big punches and elbows when she blitzes girls, that gets a reaction from the crowd. It leaves, leaves a lasting impression on the judges. Whereas Aldrich, you know, it's possible that she could outstrike Barber in, uh, in a round by being the more effective counter-striker. 
fact, because she doesn't carry that much power in her hands, she doesn't really have a way to leave her stamp on around and leave an impression on the judges. So that is definitely something to think about in this fight. If you're thinking about an Aldrich, she's just not that dangerous standing. And Barbara's got a really tricky, tricky style, which is flashy and looks good for the judges. So on the ground, the ground has probably been uh, JJ Aldrich's weakness, to be honest with you, throughout her career. You know, her two recent losses against Juliana Lima and Tatiana Suarez, it's no secret that these two, two girls are predominantly grapplers uh, and she did struggle bad against both girls. You know, her only other loss in her pro career was against Jamie Moyle by rear naked choke. So there are definitely weaknesses on the ground there, although training with a very uh, explosive and orthodox technical grappler like Rose Namajunas on a daily basis should help uh, Aldrich to make big improvements to her grappling from fight to fight. But Barber is devastating on the ground. You know, her takedown defense isn't very good at all, but she is extremely offensive on the ground. She is constantly attacking submissions, constantly looking to work with submissions to create scrambles where she can improve her position. And if she gets into top position, her ground and pound is devastating. She is vicious. She is very, very vicious. She's, an, she's able to inflict an incredible amount of damage from top position. So Aldrich... Decent on the ground, you know, um, I can't really criticise her ground game that much at all. She's just a very basic, methodical ground game where she knows what to do. She does the correct things, but Barber, much more dangerous on the ground. You'd have to expect if this fight goes to the ground, Barber could put Aldrich in some really bad positions, whereas Aldrich is just the kind of girl to look to maintain control and rack up points with some, some top control. Doesn't really attack with submissions, not particularly dangerous ground and pound. So, from a betting point of view, if we look into this fight, let's take a look at the odds. So, Aldrich was one of the names that jumped out at me this week. Uh, but like so many names that have jumped out at me, I just didn't see enough from them to pull the trigger. So, let's look at Macy Barber first of all. Her average odds at the moment are around about 1.41, which is minus 244, giving her an implied probability of 71%. I hate to be like a broken record, but... To be able to find any value on Barbara at all, you have to cap her here at seven, ha having a 76% or better chance of winning this fight. And I just think that's such a stretch. You know, for a young a young fighter, 20 years old, her body's changing all the time. Uh, she's fighting at flyweight for the first time in the UFC. Um, she's got an explosive style. She, even though her cardio has looked amazing in the past, you never know a bad weight cut, an injury, some fight week illness could cause her to do adrenaline dump and get tired. She does have a habit of getting caught on her way in, you know, because her it, it, striking defense isn't that good. Her takedown defense isn't bulletproof. You know, at sem you can't really cap her at as I'm the 76% or better chance of winning this fight. So that's an easy pass for me. Remember I say, guys, let the odds do the work for you. And then if we look at Aldrich... She's currently available at around about uh, 3.05, which is plus 205, giving her an implied probability of 33%. And I think in many ways, this is just very similar to the last fight between Peterson and also between uh, uh, Pena, where I just need to live a bet in order to, to, put, to bet on a fighter. And I just don't love, I just don't love Aldrich in this fight because... Again, to gain any real value on Aldrich, you have to give her a 40% or better chance of winning this fight. And I just don't, I just can't get there. I really can't because if it stays standing, I really feel like Barber's awkward blitzing style is going to make it difficult for Aldrich to land anything significant and leave an impression on the judges. And if it goes to the ground, Barber's just an absolute nightmare. Even if Aldrich does get into top position, you know, we still know that Barber relentlessly attacks with submissions off her back. She's constantly throwing her legs up, looking for arm bars, triangles, leg locks. And as we know, under the new scoring criteria that came in in January 2016, top position is not uh, it, top position in full guard is no longer a winning position in MMA. Full guard is a 50-50 position on the ground now. And it's going to be very difficult for Aldrich to take half guard, side control, 
or mount, which would all be considered dominant positions on the ground, because Barber is extremely active on the ground and very good at recovering positions. So it's going to be very difficult for Aldridge to pass her guard if this fight goes to the ground, which means even if Aldridge is in top position, with Barber constantly attacking submissions off her back under the new scoring, Barber is probably going to be winning the fight on the ground as well. Now we know some judges don't use the new scoring, they still favour octagon control and top position, but all we can do is go by the letter of the law and make the good, the right decisions based on the letter of the law. So for those reasons guys, give Barber a slight advantage standing and on the ground, again for Aldrich to win this fight, she's going to have to rely on Barber doing something um, to e either, you know, bad fight IQ, a mistake, underperforming, and I just don't want to bet on a fighter in those circumstances. Don't want to put my money in that position. So then the final fight that I want to talk about in today's video is another fight that's seen a little bit of line movement in the last 24 hours. So we've got Pinnacle. I've got uh, Curtis Blades at around a 1.40 favour at the moment, which is uh, minus 250, which has seen, you know, in the last 24 hours, his odds have improved quite a bit. And that's probably because... Online, I see uh, Justin Willis is probably one of the underdogs that most people favour. You know, there seems to be like a uh, an underdog pick that everyone loves for every event. You know, all the MMA media are on board, all the casual betters on Sheer Dog and, and all like the, the guys on Twitter that like the, the Sheer picks and stuff. A lot of people seem to be on Willis. Um, and, you know, I, again, with Peterson, I'm not going to say Willis is a bad bet straight off the bat. I can see why you would think Willis is a good bet. It's not personally a bet I love. Um, but we'll talk about this from a stylistic point of view, uh, how I see it. And then you can make your own mind up. So the first thing I would say about this fight is that straight off the bat, there is no doubt about it that Curtis Blades has an amazing chip. There's absolutely no doubt about it, but unfortunately, the reason why we know he's got an amazing chin is because he gets rocked or dropped or wobbled in almost every single one of his fights. You know, he lost his last fight uh, by TKO due to, uh, against Francis Ngannou after getting clipped in round one, although I watched that fight earlier on today, and, uh, you know, Mark Goddard's taken quite a bit of heat lately for some questionable uh, refereeing decisions, and this was another questionable one for me, guys. When I watched this fight live, I didn't really think much of it, um, but I definitely feel after watching it again today in the cold light of day, it was a very early stoppage. You know, Blades got wobbled a little bit in the in the early on in, in the fight, um, but he was at all stages in the fight trying to regain himself, trying to get back in there. And, and once Ngannou had landed the first big shot, wasn't really landing much more after that. Curtis Blades was doing a good job of moving around and avoiding most of those shots. But because Ngannou overwhelmed him with pressure and aggression, he swarmed him. Curtis Blades just couldn't create the space to uh, to basically reset in the middle of the octagon and show the ref that he was okay. And Goddard jumped in and stopped it. And I do feel like it was an early stoppage. So perhaps this loss, a little bit unlucky for Blades. And he did talk a little bit about that this week in the media interviews that... You know, he was fine, but because Nganu was just so aggressive and overwhelming, he just couldn't get away from Nganu and create the space to show the ref that, that he was fine. He also got uh, wobbled by Alistair Overeem, also got knocked out by Mark Hunt, and in round one against Daniel Omelanchuk, he also got wobbled. So that is the reason why we know Curtis Blades has got an amazing chin, um, because he, he, he gets rocked and wobbled a lot, but he manages to fight through it. Now, what's significant about that? is that uh, the reason why he gets rocked and dropped and wobbled a lot is because he has got very bad striking defense. Blades, for whatever reason, uh, is very hittable. And, I, I, and the f reason why I think he is so hittable is because he's a very tall guy for the heavyweight division. You know, he's six foot four. And as he comes forward, you know, he is primarily a wrestler. So as he comes forward, he's kind of like crunched down in a, in, a, in a stance where he's getting ready to shoot in on his opponent. You'll kind of see him with it, you know, his back humped over and getting ready to, to basically shoot in on his opponent. That's the kind of stance he uses. And quite often you'll see him come forward with his head down where he's going to change levels. And at that point, his, his chin's exposed, his head's a stationary target, and that's at the point that he gets clipped a lot. Now, one thing that saved him in his last few fights against Omilanchuk, Hunt, and Overeem is that when he's been getting clipped, he's fought guys that haven't got the best takedown defense. Now, Overeem does have amazing takedown defense, 
to some extent for a very large period of Mark Hunt's career. He had good takedown defence as well. Um, but what I would say is very shortly after these three guys hurt Curtis Blades, they gave up very easy takedowns. So if you go back and watch these fights, you'll notice that when Blades uh, got wobbled by all of them, he immediately shot a takedown and they all immediately basically gave up a takedown, which gave him an opportunity to recover. What's interesting about this fight is that Justin Willis trains at American Kickboxing Academy with the likes of Cain Velasquez you know, and, uh, and Daniel Cormier. So even though we haven't seen that much of his wrestling because you know he's only had nine pro fights and uh, his last two fights, a big part of those two fights were standing, a good period of the Mulholland fight was standing as well, you'd have to expect he's got pretty good takedown defense. And uh, and even though that's an assumption, you know, it's a fair assumption to make with him training at AKA being 31 years old. Uh, he's had a lot of time to train with those guys. You know, he's been competing uh, and training at AKA since 2012, which would be, you know, almost eight years now. So um, that's also significant, the takedown defense thing, because... Curtis Blades is sold as a wrestler, but he doesn't have the best offensive wrestling. If you go back and watch Curtis Blades' past fights, you'll see that the vast majority of his wrestling shots, his takedowns, come above his opponent's hips, above hip height. And that's partly because of his height, because he's so tall, he struggles to get in deep on his opponent's hips. Now, if you go and watch all the great wrestlers in MMA, you'll notice that the most effective style of wrestling is again, use the example of a skyscraper where you put explosives at the bottom of a skyscraper. In order to take guys down, you need to get in deep on their hips, deep on their legs and upset their balance. But Blades doesn't have, really have that style of wrestling. He tends to shoot high above his opponent's hips, which means when he starts to face opponents with better takedown defense, you know, not guys like Omilanchuk, Hunter, Overeem, He's really going to struggle to take guys down. And that is one of the reasons why he lost this fight against Francis Ngannou. You know, Ngannou has got very strong hips. And he was basically able to just defend takedowns, get underhooks in play early in this fight. Because Blades was shooting in above hip height. And uh, Ngannou was able to shut him down. Whereas the adjustment uh, Stipe made on Ngannou was... Stipe did get in deep on Ngannou's hips, which is why he was able to take him down much more frequently than Blades was. That There's a very uh, big difference there in the techniques used. And Blades, just not that effective, which is interesting. Because, uh, you know, if you start shooting in above hip height on Justin Willis, with him training like with guys like DC and Kane... Uh, I would imagine Willis would, would do a pretty good job of, of shutting down Blades' offensive wrestling. So I really think from a wrestling point of view, both these guys are going to cancel each other out. I don't see Willis taking Blades down. You know, Blades is very athletic. He's a strong wrestler. Um, you know, he might not have the best offensive wrestling technique, but when he's on the ground, he's devastating. Also defensively, he's good. So I think they cover each other out. I think we could see very large portions of this fight take place in the clinch or standing. So when it comes to uh, striking, you know, I mentioned that Curtis Blades does have a good chin, but he tends to eat a lot of bombs. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure if that's going to be an issue in this fight. So if we look at Willis's record, he's not exactly a, a deadly striker. He, uh, three of his last four fights have gone the distance. Um, and, you know, Chase Sherman, we know that he's got, you know, a questionable chin, not the best strike in defence. James Mulhern, you know, he's a, a striker from the UK, quite short. Um, you know, Sherman and Mulhern, if, if Willis was that dangerous striking, you'd expect him to be blowing through guys like that, and he didn't. Which makes me think that even though uh, Willis, you know, Willis could catch Blades with something big. You know, we've seen Blades caught many times in the past. He's not exactly dangerous. The only thing that, that makes me think he, he has got a chance is that when Blades has eaten shots in the past and got wobbled, he's been able to instantly get a takedown. Whereas, you know, Willis has got good takedown defense, probably. You know, there's an asterisk next to that. It's a bit of an assumption. So what I'm trying to say is if Blades was to get wobbled by Willis, 
he may not be able to buy himself time to recover by landing a takedown because Willis would be able to shut that takedown down, which may open up the possibility for Willis to follow up with shots and get the finish. Finally got out what I was trying to say. So, from a betting point of view, let's take a look at this one. This is a fight a lot of people are interested in. So, the odds, like I say, on Blades, 1.40, which is minus 250. To be able to pull the trigger on Blades, you have to give him uh, a better than 76% chance of winning this fight, which uh, I'm not prepared to do, simply because... All, knock, all heavyweights carry knockout power, and with Blades getting rocked or dropped in pretty much all of his fights, Willis is still a big guy. He's not that dangerous, but he still does hit hard. He's a big guy. Um, it's just there's no not enough value there for me to give Blades a 76% or better chance of winning this fight. is a big stretch for me, so that's an easy pass, letting the odds do the work for you. But I've seen a lot of people on about rolling the dice on Willis. So the best odds you can get on him at the moment are around 3.20, giving him an implied probability of plus 220. Uh, sorry, a, a money line American odds of plus 220 for an implied probability of 31%. And again, I hate to sound like a broken record, guys, but you can probably tell where I'm going with this. The, the issue I have with betting a guy like Willis in this fight is Blades does fight at a high pace. He has excellent cardio for a heavyweight. And he can outwork Willis in all areas. You know, he can drive Willis into the cage and grind on him in a clinch and chip away at him with knees and short punches and elbows. He can throw a higher volume of strikes. He can outstrike out out Willis if he stays standing. I just don't think that Willis has got the cardio to match the pace that Blades will set for three rounds. So while there's not really that big of a technical advantage for either guy anywhere... I just think that Blades' work rate is going to carry him through here. And Blades' work rate is going to be the difference. And that's the reason why I think Blades is going to win. So again, just like in the other two fights, yes, I can see Willis winning. I can see why people would want to bet Willis. Uh, there's probably a little bit more value on Willis than, than Peterson and Aldrich. But, I mean... Like I say, I just want to bet fighters on merit. I want to put my money in strong positions. I want to love these bets. And I just don't see Willis winning this fight on merit. I think the only way that he could win is if he were to catch Blades with something big. Or if Blades were to underform, uh, underperform and make a mistake. And I just don't want to put my money in those situations. I want to bet on fighters who can win because they've got skills to win uh, with one very specific path to victory. And I don't see that here. So that is it guys. That's another three fights. It's not that exciting to be passing on these fights or recommend that you pass on these fights. But at the same time, it's not exciting losing money either. In fact, it sucks. So I don't care about you know having to keep things tight and, and stick to a small number of bets. The way I personally look at things is this is not about what we do, you know, gambling, betting on MMA. This is not about being the smartest guy in the bar. This is not about winning a 10 fighter parlay. This is not about winning 30 units per event and it hitting all these fancy prop bets and picking all these fancy underdogs. It's not about that. It's about earning money every single week, trying to grind out a profit every single week so you can grow your account balances, grow your bankroll, compound your profits and get to a position where you can change your life and you can start to make significant amounts of money. And you will not make significant amounts of money if you feel pressured and forced into placing bets which just aren't good bets. Yes, you know, I'm not going to say the underdog bets that, I've, that we've talked about in today's video are terrible bets. You know, if one of them wins, you would break even or make a slight profit. If two of them wins, you know, you'd obviously make a decent sized profit. I can see why people would be prepared to roll the dice. But I want to make money. I want to pay the mortgage at the end of the month. And I want to buy nice cars and being too loose, taking too many risks will eat into your profits. And it'll just derail the growth of your money over time. So I would recommend passing on those fights today, guys. But thank you for watching this video. Hit the like button below if you appreciated these breakdowns and this analysis. And I will work very hard tomorrow and also on Saturday to bring you part four of this video. And also uh, a video about Bellator 2 and 8 or possibly KSW 47. And remember to check out that other video that I put out yesterday about betting on KSW. And also, guys, one last thing. Subscribe to help the channel grow. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take care. Good night. And I will speak to you soon.